Now, in Nephi, in, in Moroni, rather, chapter 10, you've got a thousand years of Nephite history and Nephite gospel and doctrine uh, just boiled down and compacted into a final great testimony. One of the great chapters of the Book of Mormon is Nephi 10, or Moroni 10, pardon. In Moroni 10, he starts out, and we all know how this is, what this means, he starts out with giving us the formula to get a testimony of the Book of Mormon. That's Moroni 10 and 4. If anyone doesn't know Moroni 10 and 4, that's how to get a testimony. And then what's Moroni 10 and 5 all about? He says, hey, don't stop with Moroni 10 and 4. That's only how to get a testimony. Moroni 10 and 5, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you can know the truth of all things. If you hear something here today and you don't know whether it's true, don't get riled. What do you do? Bless the Lord, just like you did when someone presented the Book of Mormon to you. Right? It's the, it's the role of a teacher to stretch minds. It's the role of the teacher to break down barriers. It's the role of a teacher to expand and sometimes literally to bowl you over. That's the role. Now, some teachers use that and then end up teaching something contrary to the truth. But a true teacher then will teach you something maybe you didn't hear before or know before. And then what's your challenge? Go to Moroni 10 and 5. Go home and pray about it. Study about it. I've had some things where it's first been presented to me and even where the Spirit of the Lord presented it to me. Honest. I said, hey, Lord, I just don't know about that. Now, I have had that experience where I just said, wow, Lord, I just don't know about that. I'm going to have to hang on to that a little while. And then I go study it and pray about it, and I say, thanks, Lord, for your extreme mercy. Wow. I'm glad I got over that one, and I'm glad I got expanded a little bit, see? All right, so Moroni 10 and 5. Then after Moroni 10 and 5, then he delineates the spiritual gifts which should belong to the church. And after he talks about the spiritual gifts, and we call these gifts of the Holy Ghost, don't we? You know what 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 does? Calls them gifts of the Holy Ghost. And also DNC 46, where you got another list of them. All right. He uses these gifts, and they're called gifts of the Holy Ghost. But how does the Book of Mormon call them? Read verse 17. And all these gifts come by the Spirit of Christ, and they come unto every man severally according to his will. Now, is that a contradiction with calling them the gifts of the Holy Ghost? No, it isn't. Why? Because the Holy Ghost gets his truth and power his gifts from Christ. You see that? And in the Book of Mormon, you've got a special focus on Christ. The title page, that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself into all nations. See, not just the Son of God now, the eternal God. And in the sense now of the Father's appointments, in the sense that the Father has given all things to center in Christ, in that this person is is Alpha and Omega, the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet, is the beginning and the end. Now, what's outside the beginning and the end? Nothing. Everything centers in Christ, right? How many gods are there then? For us now in this fallen state, unredeemed, and in the process of redemption, how many gods are there? And the answer is one. And who is he? Christ, the Father, and the Son. Now that's the Book of Mormon doctrine. And what relation does the Holy Ghost have to it? He's subordinate to Christ. He takes of Christ and manifests it to us. Now can you get that picture from the Book of Mormon? Study it over, because that testimony is taught over and over and over again. All right, now Christ then is the great creator, and since all things have been centered by the Father in him, he's the Father of heaven and earth and of all things which in them are. Now over in Job chapter 32, verse 8, 
We have Job saying there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of God giveth him understanding. Now, as I dissect that statement, it says to me that there's three principles there. There's the organized human spirit with its central primal intelligence, and we call that one. And then there's man with a reference now to the physical organism, and uh, that's the second. And then it says, and the inspiration of God giveth him understanding. Now, that's a third principle, see. As I read the first chapter of the book of John, uh, John testifies that Christ is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. All right, so that within me, for example, there are three principles of life. There's an organized spirit. This is old, broken-down frame that I've got that can't run as fast as it used to. Uh, that's the second principle. And then there's this indwelling, quickening principle of life. Now, I get my spirit body from the man of holiness. He's my father in that sense. I get my physical father from my, my physical body from my physical father, right? And he's the source and giver of that, right? And my mother. All right, now... There's this quickening principle of life by which I live and move and have a being, to quote Paul's statement on Mars Hill to the Athenians, okay? And uh, who's the father of that? Christ. You see that? He's the great creator of all things, and he's the father of heaven and of earth and of all things which then in them are. Now, that includes the bed bugs and the fleas. So be reverent to those little rascals, will you? <clears throat> They've got a great father. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> now, in that sense, then, everything on earth is not only created, but has a father-son, or so as it is, relationship with Christ. Now, when you get to the doctrine of rebirth, the new birth, uh, and the enter into the newness of life that leads to eternal life, then you turn that basic rheostat up, you see, through the ordinance of the gospel, through faith in Christ, and through the ordinances and the laying on of hands, and the baptism of fire, and so forth. You, you turn that rheostat up, and then on a higher level, then Christ becomes your Father, see? And that's only the beginning of a succession of steps that go on up above that. Okay? All right, so Christ, then, is the Father of heaven and earth. And when it comes to the creation, then, he created the earth. He created this earth. He did so as the great executive of the man of holiness. And uh, he had the intelligence and the understanding to bring it into being and to give it form and organization and to place life upon it. And in that sense, then, he played the role of the great creator. And then, because he extends his spirit, glory, and power, then he is the Father of heaven and earth, and of all things which in them are. Now, when the earth was created, in what state was it? We need, we need to recognize this and see what the Book of Mormon teaches on the subject. We've got so many ideas loose in the world in relation to the origins of life that are almost taken uh, just to, without qualification that have no foundation in truth and uh, that need to be understood and we need to see things in relation to the gospel and then uh, hopefully take it from there and reconcile things in relation to Christ, not on the basis of making Christ compatible with man-made theory. But let me turn, for example, to Second Nephi chapter 2. Now, here is... Uh, uh, Lehi speaking, and his information, as you study it out, he apparently gets from the brass plates of Laban, which contain an account of the creation, and uh, probably with some more details to it and some more insights to creation than we have in, in the King James Bible. Now, he's talking about the situation of Adam if he did not... Uh, had he not partaken of the, of the forbidden fruit. He's talking about the situation of Adam before the fall. And note what he says. 
And now, verse, verse 22, And now, behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen. But he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end. And they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. Now let me just analyze that a minute with you. Uh, all things which were created must remain in the same state. How broad and inclusive is the word all? Some people have the idea that in the Garden of Eden you had one state of, situ of, of life and outside of the Garden another one. Now, what does Lehi think about it? All things which were created were in the same state. Right? Granted, there was a garden. Granted, you had uh, uh, the residence. You had the extra beauty that uh, goes with the, the decoration of the garden and all of that. But the whole earth essentially was in the same general condition. Now, what does it mean that they were all, uh, that had it not been for the the creation, all the, the transgression, all things would have remained in the same state. What does the word state mean? Sometimes when you got a little time, take a concordance, Reynolds' concordance of the Book of Mormon, and just look under the word state, and then go and study every passage where that word is used and see what it says. Now, for myself, I, I don't read the Book of Mormon from beginning to end very often. I don't think I've read it from beginning to end more than four or five times in my life. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, and I envy people who do do that. But the way I study it, the way I study it, is like I've suggested. You go get Reynolds' Concordance and just follow every word and see what it means, see? And then you take that same word and go find it in all the other scriptures and see what has been revealed on a given idea, you see, and study it over and mull it over. Now, you can read it clear through and over and over again, and that's fine, and it, there's a certain benefit that you don't pick up this other way, but uh, studying the scriptures, I think, goes back to the, the old Jewish connotation. When you study the scriptures, you take a verse and you analyze every word, and then you analyze every word in relation to every other word, and then you define all the terms, and then you find out what those terms mean, and then you find out how those same terms have been used in other scriptures, and when you get through, you begin to see what the idea is. Now, for example. Alma talked about the state of the soul between death and the resurrection. What does the word state mean? It's the condition of life. The Book of Mormon says that this earth was in a fallen state, and it uses that word again. The Book of Mormon says it's a probationary state. The Book of Mormon says it's a carnal state, and not that a given individual is carnal. But, but the order of things, it's a corrupt state. That's another expression in the Book of Mormon, see. And then that we're here to meet the challenges of this probationary state in order to prepare for a state of endless peace and rest in the presence of God, see. Now, the word state, then, means a condition or order of things, the law, the order, the system. Now, when Lehi says... If Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must remain in the same state. Then he says that there is a, there's a law and a program and an order of life, and that order of life, there was no death in that order of life, and it would have stayed and continued and continued unless things were changed. And in that condition, then, he says Adam and Eve would have had no children. Apparently, they didn't have the power 
of procreation. And uh, he says, Wherefore, they would have remained in the state of innocence, having no joy. Now, the word joy, what does it mean scripturally? The joy of our redemption. Joy scripturally, when Lehi says, Man is that they might have joy. Joy scripturally is what you have when you've been dipped into mortality, in the fallen state, in the darkness and the trauma and the contradictions and the inconsistencies of the fallen state, and then through Christ come into his presence again and feel the truth and the power and the happiness that comes when you feel you're back home, you're back in your right mind, as it were, and you feel at peace and at one with your Father in heaven. See, that's joy. See, It's the joy of redemption. And it's not just going out and having a picnic. Uh, that's happiness and goodness and good things. But joy now has a much deeper connotation. All right, so the earth then was in this state. And there was no death. And things would have continued in that order of things forever. The Adam and Eve scenario would still be going on today. There would still be a Garden of Eden in Jackson County, Missouri, and the whole earth would still be in the presence of God today, had there not been transgression. The state would never have changed. Now, that's what he's saying. All right, now, in that order of things, then, uh, from that, certain questions come up. Over here in Alma chapter 12, uh, Alma is taking care of some of the, uh, it's Amulek, rather, is taking care of some of the questions that follow from his exchange with Zizram, the one that we just mentioned. And uh, uh, the question is asked here, beginning in verse 21, What does the scripture mean which saith that God placed cherubim and the flaming sword on the east of the Garden of Eden, lest our first parents should enter and partake of the fruit of the tree of life and live forever. And thus we see that there was no possible chance for him to live forever. See, uh, the question is, why this, and there's, and there's no possibility to live forever, so why are you talking about eternity? Now, Alma answered, and he says, this is the thing which I was about to explain. Now we see that Adam did fall by the partaking of the forbidden fruit, according to the word of God. And thus we see that by his fall all mankind became a lost and fallen people. Now, there are not many of us believe that. Most of us are oriented in our image of ourselves by Western civilization. We read of uh, Western man, uh, way back in the days of the Renaissance, going on from one great intellectual achievement after another to achieve liberty and achieve uh, the benefits of the scientific revolution and the great economic benefits of uh, the capitalist system and all of that, see. And uh, we look at ourselves now at the pinnacle, the very pinnacle of an, an era that's brought us to walk on the moon and uh, conquer space and uh, to have an atomic age to discover the secrets of the atom with the hope that maybe we can use them to foster the kind of life that we want, which isn't, for many people in America these days, too Christian. But we, we have this mental attitude of great big Western man, right? And we're kind of oriented toward that. Now, the Book of Mormon kind of pours a little water on that one. Now, it doesn't uh, deny... The achievements of the West talks about a mighty Gentile nation. It does make it clear that the Lord is at the root of that development, and he is. I've been spending the last eight years from five o'clock every morning for six days a week until the walls begin to fade in and out on me in the afternoon. Day after day after day for eight years on the origins of the Constitution. I haven't given birth to anything yet. I'm going to get something and abandon it to the publishers one of these times. 
But I can tell you in all humility and sobriety that Christ is the source of our liberty. And that degree of the Holy Spirit, which those early founders and their predecessors achieved, that and Christ is the basis of our liberty. See? And so the great big humanistic Western image of great Western man simply is a fabrication. It is a literal fabrication. And so this idea of how great we are in that sense is, is out of line. We need the Book of Mormon. Oh, how great, says the Book of Mormon, is the nothingness of man. And as Amulet put it, they became a lost and a fallen people. Now, that's not Calvinism. That's not the doctrine of human depravity, that man has no virtue in him and he can't do any good. Now, that's not that. But it is a doctrine that's realistic that tells us in this life we are in the midst of a battlefield. We, we land in mortality with both feet in the midst of a battlefield. And unless we turn to Christ, we have no chance to survive. We're like being on the reverse unit of an escalator. Because all you have to do is stand there and you'll go down. If you just stand there and don't exercise your faith. And so the great challenge then is to be on that reverse unit and moving down into darkness, distortion, dissipation, you name it, and then look up and see the hope of Christ and the power of his spirit and have the necessary faith now to reach up and to counter that downward move and overcome the adversities of the world, be changed, transformed, become new creatures in Christ, and finally come back even like the brother of Jared into God's presence, or the next step up is in. See, now we're in the midst of a battlefield, and looking at it from the mortal standpoint, then we are a lost and a fallen people. Without Christ, there would be no resurrection, as we said this morning. Without Christ, if you were to die, your spirit then would be dominated by Lucifer. There would be no influence of the Holy Spirit or the light of Christ in your life. And under that kind of a situation, you would die as unto things of righteousness, to use the Book of Mormon expression. And you would eventually become a devil. And you would have no more desires for righteousness than Lucifer himself. And that means then that when we come to mortality, we are a lost and a fallen people. And the Book of Mormon teaches that clearly. And we need to know, and our young people need to know, that they've got to learn to fight the battle of faith in Christ. They've got to get over that he's just an elder brother patting them on the back. He is their Lord and their God. He can become their father. They can grow up to be like him. All that he did in the way of power and truth, they can do. He says... The works that I do, ye shall do also, because I go unto my Father. Because he went through the Father and made the atonement, then the time can come, if not here in eternity, when I can do greater things than Jesus did, because he becomes my Father and I can grow up to be like him. Now that's the concept of the Book of Mormon, see? But realize that we are a lost and fallen people and we've got to meet that battle and that challenge. All right, so... As he said, we come a lost and a fallen people, and he goes on and says, Now behold, I say unto you, that if it had been possible for Adam to have partaken of the fruit of the tree of life, at that time there would have been no death. Now Adam would have fallen, he would have been out of God's presence, but the action of the tree of life would have countered the action of the forbidden fruit, and he would have lived forever out of God's presence, or as we sometimes said, he would live forever in his sins. You see that? And so what did the Lord do? He sent cherubim, guard the way of the tree of life. Eventually the tree of life was literally taken from the earth, and it will be restored one day, and the righteous will be able to partake of it, but it was taken from the earth. And uh, that is a part of this great probationary state that he goes on and speaks about. And uh, in that sense, then, he talks about, and I won't take time to read the rest of Alma 12, but let me suggest that you do so, 
to get that picture as he gives it to you in relation to the fall. Now, let's move on. The fall, actually, is a, is a two-stage process. And we need to recognize that so you don't blame everything on Adam. Uh, let me turn to the fifth chapter of the book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price. This is the account of the introduction of the gospel into this, into this world. And uh, Adam and Eve then beget sons and daughters. They in turn married. Adam began and achieved the status of grandfatherhood. And all that way along the line, he had been given the law of sacrifice, which he diligently obeyed. And then one day an angel came to him and said, Now, why do you do this, Adam? And he says, I know not, except the Lord my God has commanded me. And then the angel said, and this is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father who is full of grace and truth. This is patterned after that, see. Now you do what look forward to Christ. He is the life and the light of the world. He's your Redeemer. He's going to become your Father also as you go through the processes of rebirth, see. Now, as Adam heard that, Mother Eve was listening by as a dutiful wife. And uh, she apparently got some tremendous insights. You have to have great respect for Mother Eve. It says, Eve, his wife, heard all these things and was glad, saying, Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed, we wouldn't have had any kids, and never should have known good and evil and the joy of our redemption. Now, what's joy to her? It's the joy of redemption. It's the joy of having fallen and then feeling the powers of the Spirit through Christ and the witness of redemption and the truth and power that comes. That's the joy of redemption, see? And the eternal life which God giveth unto the, unto the obedient. All right, now, Adam and Eve joyfully, they went to their kids and hold the hell of family home evening. And they told all of these things to their kids. Now, this was before Cain and Abel were born. And uh, meantime, then Satan, right Johnny on the spot as he is, began to do his thing. And it says in verse 13, and, Cain, and Satan came among them, saying, I am also a son of God. And he commanded them, saying, Believe it not. And they believed it not, and they loved Satan more than God. Now, that's Adam's first batch of kids. Now, note, though, the, answer, the next statement. And men began from that time forth to be carnal, sensual, and devilish. Now, did the fall make them carnal, sensual, and devilish? No. What did the fall do? Got them out of the presence. If there's carnality, is that the responsibility of Adam? The answer is no. If there's any carnality in our lives, we better look in the mirror. You see that? Because the fall just takes us out of the presence, and it's when we then love Satan. And some people, I've, I've loved Satan more than the Lord, and so have you, if you'll be honest about it. When you come down to a situation that you know darn well is wrong, and the adrenaline starts to flow, and the vanity starts to flow, or whatever, and you finally begin to go through the rationalizing process, and you finally put your hand behind you, the hand of reason and sanity, and you go ahead and act on the impulse of emotion, whatever kind it may be. You choose to love Satan at that point more than God. And you've done it, and I've done it. And it's a great challenge to meet the thing right at that point. The Lord's been very, very good to me. As a young boy, he gave me a, a special and select gift of the Spirit. It's called the gift of the knowledge of the Word. And ever since I've been a kid, as I used to sit on an Idaho farm and on the ditch bank, letting the water run wild while I was reading Chief of Theology <laughs> or some other church record book, which my dad says he didn't think I could understand, and that was just a challenge to him. 
Ever since then, as I've read the scriptures, it just seems at times that the neon lamps turn on. And the witness of the Spirit says, this is what it means. And then I've gone to good people, good faithful brethren, even members of the College of Religion, where I used to be affiliated, and say, hey, let me tell you what I found. I had a wow experience, a eureka experience. And they look at it and say, I don't see that. And that's true, they don't. But the Lord has given me a kind of a gift. And the greatest challenge that has I've had is, Lord, shut the darn thing off. Why? Because meeting this challenge of wrestling with the fallen state and knowing with some sincerity of heart that you're really not measuring up to what you know. And then the, the flow just still goes on. The light still goes on. And you're just not cutting it. You're just not hacking it. You're just, you're just not really there where you know you ought to be. And some of the most desperate prayers I've ever prayed is, Lord, shut this thing off. I simply can't handle it. And then I come around on the second kind of prayer and says, Lord, thanks for the gift. Please give me some strength. Please help me to meet the challenge like I have needed. Now that's the fallen state, see. That's the fallen, and we all go through that. And if you're not, don't admit it, you're dishonest, really, I think. If you don't admit it. But you can't run away from it. You finally have to drop to your knees and find, find a sacred place. And I used to, as a kid on the farm, have an old briar patch. You couldn't get in there except by a little narrow path. And that was my sacred grove. I'd go in there and wrestle with the Lord and pray for strength. Now, that's the kind of thing we're talking about, see? So we're in a fallen state, and that fallen state is a two-stage state. Adam put us in the fall, and we then put ourselves in a condition of being carnal, devilish, and so forth, see? And that's the situation. But now, in this whole situation, then, where, where uh, the benefits, then, of uh, mortal life are coupled with the challenges, the trials, the exigencies, the trauma of contradiction and the forces within ourselves, I think it was Peanuts or else Pogo who says, we've met the enemy and he's us. <laughs> Uh, I think that's so appropriate, see. As you, as you see that, then you begin to understand the doctrine of the fall and of the gospel plan as revealed in the Book of Mormon. For example, here's that great and noble saint, King Benjamin. And he gets his text from an angel of the Lord and then takes it to his people and delivers it the next day. And as he does, then he teaches them some sacred truths that we all need to know. Here in Mosiah chapter 3, verse 18, beginning two or three lines down from the beginning of the verse. Men drink damnation to their own souls, except they humble themselves and become as little children and believe that salvation was and is and is to come in and through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, or the Lord Omnipotent. Now, what do men do? You just have to stand there, and it happens. You drink damnation to your own souls unless you do something positive. If you just stand there, you drink damnation. You don't have to do anything. Just be a good guy or a good person, see? You drink damnation to your own souls unless you humble yourself and become as little children, and believe, and note Christ again is the center of this, as Helen May said in the great vision of Nephi, believe then that salvation was and is and is to come in and through the blood of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. And then he adds, for, and that word for is a transitional conjunction, for the natural man, the person who is acclimated to this fallen state, is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam, and will be forever and ever. 
unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atoning atonement of Christ the Lord and becometh the child submissive, meek, and humble, and so forth. See, you know, we sing this little song, but I am a child of God. And that's a beautiful one. That's, I just love that little song. But we need to have another song. That song is oriented about being children of our Father in Heaven, the man of holiness, isn't it? Now, what happens to us merely as children of our Father in Heaven? <laughs> we come down here under the earth under the power of the fall. And if you're a natural person, you're an enemy to God. Now, do you, does an enemy to God have any, any family privileges? Do you claim the blessings of being a son of our Father in Heaven if you're a natural man? What does Jacob say is the end result? Without Christ, what does he say? The body would lay down to Mother Earth and rise no more, and what would happen to the spirit, as we've said two or four times? They would deteriorate in righteousness and become a devil, right? Now, that's what would happen if we were just children of our Father in Heaven and nothing else. And so we need to write another song about becoming sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Now, if any of you are talented, do that. And make it as appealing as this other, because it's only when you come to the Father who loves you dearly through Christ that you can then put off the natural man where you're an enemy, where a son and a noble daughter now becomes an enemy. Only through Christ, then, can you put off the natural man and become a saint through the powers of the Spirit. Do you see that? And so focus your attention, just like as we've said here, the Father planted everything in Christ. This person right here is the primary person. He is our Lord. He is our God. He becomes our Father. Does that, does that nullify all of this? No. We just recognize the appointment of the Father. The appointment of the Father is, believe in my beloved Son, you see. As he said to Joseph in the sacred grove, this is my beloved son. Hear him. He's running the show. The father didn't explain anything to Joseph except to hear his son. Now, that's the Book of Mormon doctrine, see? That's the Book of Mormon. Re-enthrone Christ. Put him at the center of the plan. All right, now, in this program, then, Christ gives us two general kinds of blessings, what I would or benefits. One I would denominate as unconditional benefits, benefits that are given to all people unconditionally. Now, what are the unconditional benefits that are given to us by and through the Atonement of Jesus Christ? Let me just enumerate them rapidly. We'll have to hurry. Number one, there's the gift of mortal life. To explain that, let me just get our mortal bucket on the there. Here we are down here in mortality, hugging terra firma. Here's Adam. He fell and brought us down here. Now, that first spiritual death is not complete. The power of the atonement began to operate even as the fall of Adam took place. Here in the teachings, page 190, the prophet makes this clarification. He says, everlasting covenant was made between three personages before the organization of this earth and relates to their dispensation of things to men on the earth. That is what they're going to give out to men. These personages, according to Abraham's record, are God the first, the creator, God the second, the redeemer, and God the third, the witness or the testator. Now, in this everlasting covenant, Christ signed the promissory note attesting to the fact that he would make the atonement. Something like maybe some of you folks might go to your local bank. you got a good character. you got a good possibility of repaying something. You can sign a promissory note for a couple of thousand dollars or whatever it is. And even though you haven't paid it back, you go out and start spending that thousand dollars. Now, that's what Jesus did. He signed a promissory note before at the, in the, the origins of things of the creation of the earth. And then as the fall took place, the power of the atonement 
checked it so that it wouldn't be complete. See, there wouldn't even be any sunlight without the power of the atonement. Read section 88. Christ is the light of the sun and the power thereof, and all that, see. There wouldn't be any quickening life within me. Christ might have created all things, but he wouldn't have anything over which to be a father in creation. Because that quickening principle that gives me life would be withdrawn, and I'd be living down here without it, and that means after the second breath there wouldn't be much life. So the first gift that Christ gives to us, then, is the gift of mortal life. In him we live and move and had a being. And what does good King Benjamin say? That he gives you breath, sustains you from day to day, isn't that it? And gives you your agency? See, it's all in that context. Now, the second thing that the atonement does unconditionally relates to little children. They are innocent in Christ. And Moroni uh, 8, who quotes his father, Mormon, is a classic statement on that, see? Children are alive in Christ. And this is why it's such a heinous thing to baptize little children. It doesn't do them any good one way or another. And I don't suspect it does them too much harm. I mean, they're victims. But uh, the very act by people who claim to be Christians of baptizing little children says essentially that the atonement of Christ does not extend unconditionally to them. And so infant baptism is a denial of the atonement of Christ. And there's his free gift to little children who said, Blessed are little children, forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. You see that? Now the next benefit then is, is uh, that which is given to children. And then this also extends to people without law. The Book of Mormon again teaches this. Read, uh, for example, Mosiah 3.11 and 2 Nephi 9.25 and 6. People who die without law, the benefits of the atonement cover them. And in some measure, if I can just put forth a, a personal opinion, I think there are a lot of our youth who grow up who aren't really taught as clearly as they ought to. I've seen them as a bishop and a member of the state presidency on BYU campus and religion faculty, where I've rubbed children with a lot of them, and where they've come to me in personal and private consultation. And they've done things, and they didn't really know that they were so bad until they went through it and the Spirit of the Lord withdrew, and then, then they had some problems, see. Now, if a person isn't really told what's the truth, then they're in the realm where there's some uh, room for mercy through the atonement. Now, another benefit that's important, and I, I just wish that somehow this one had got in the Bible. Uh, as I say, I've been spending eight years on stuff background of the Constitution. That goes clear back into the Reformation and the hassles, for example, that Erasmus and Luther had over free will and all of that kind of thing. And if they'd have had Second Nephi 2, it would solve the whole problem. <laughs> if they'd have just had Second Nephi 2, uh, Luther simply didn't believe in the free agency of the individual. And uh, neither did Calvin. They didn't believe in the free agency. They fought against it. Erasmus did, and they just literally bombarded him. But note, for example, how Lehi puts it. He says, for example, here in Second Nephi 2, verse uh, uh, 26, And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he might redeem the children of men from the fall. Note this. And because that they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever. Now, it doesn't talk about first being baptized. Because Christ redeemed men from the fall, there is a freedom of choice that is given to every individual. Through Christ, we call it spiritual and moral freedom. Through Christ. We call it spiritual and moral freedom. 
you're suspended, as we've said, between glory and perdition. And uh, you're in the midst of the battlefield. And as a person here where the atonement of Christ pays the debt of the sin of Adam, so that we say that men are to be judged for their own transgressions and not for Adam, see? That's what, that's what the prophet was getting at there in the second article of faith, see? A person then is free to choose the influence of the Spirit of the Lord and move upward, or he can choose the influence of the adversary and move downward, see? And that freedom comes unconditionally to every person by and through the atonement. Now note how Lehi explains it. Because of men, because that they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the law of the great and the last day according to the commandments God has given. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given to them which are expedient unto man, and they are free to choose liberty or eternal life. Now note, freedom and liberty are not the same thing in Lehi's opinion. There's a basic agency, and you can choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediation of all men. That's through Christ. You can come on up, and through Christ, you can choose then liberty and eternal life and kindly come back. Or, he says, choose captivity and death through the power of the devil, for he speaketh that all men might be miserable like unto themselves. And then he applies this teaching to his sons. He says, And now, my sons, I will that you should look to the great mediator and hearken unto his great commandments and be faithful unto his words and choose eternal life according to the will of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you choose? You choose through the Holy Spirit to follow it, and it leads you to eternal life. And he says, And not choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh and the evil which is therein. Now, you need to do a little thinking on this one. The flesh of itself, intrinsically, in essence, is not evil. For example, the LDS idea of the origin of life, as Joda Fielding Smith and others have taught, and as Joda Smith taught, and all the prophets I know have said anything about it, is that the Lord planted the garden eastward in Eden. He took a bag of seeds with him. Now, where did those seeds come from? And the scripture teaches that Adam was the son of God. Luke does it in chapter, what is it, three or four, the end of the chapter. And if you read the, the book of Moses, uh, the book of Moses says the same thing. What I'm saying is this. If you could trace the genealogy of your physical body back, one generation after another, you would eventually find that you are a literal descendant in the flesh of the man of holiness. That's what I'm saying. Now, is the flesh then something that's bad? Not much. Is sex something that's bad? No. But what happened in the fallen state? Through the forbidden fruit, and through the corruption that we have created and that we pass on as we corrupt ourselves, then uh, the physical body has corruption in it. And where does Lucifer operate? The Spirit of the Lord operates on your spirit, just like Joseph Smith said, that the Spirit acts upon the human spirit in the abstract, separate and apart from affinity to the mortal body just as though you didn't have a mortal body. That's how the prophet put it. And then you have the challenge, getting that revelation through your spirit to meet the challenge of discipline and of faith to get that spirit into your physical body to sanctify it, see? But that's how the process comes. It goes from there, then, from the spirit into the flesh. Now, how does Lucifer operate? Note what he says. Not choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh, and the evil which is therein. Now, where is there evil? There's corruption in the flesh. And note what he says then about that. 
he says, which giveth the spirit of the devil power to captivate, to bring you down to hell, that he may reign over you in his own kingdom. So Lucifer then operates in an element congenial to himself, in the corruption in the flesh. And when the emotions are riled up, or temptations are given, and so forth, and you allow the adrenaline to flow, and we allow then the emotions to get out of check, then there is an element of corruption within that physical body. It expresses itself in vanity, in pride, in lust, and in other ways. And when you yield then to that, Lucifer then puts his two cents worth in, and his spirit and his power is involved with that corruption and the design is to bring us down to hell. You see that? Now we're in the midst of a battlefield, but we have then the spirit from above. And that's what we call spiritual and moral agency. See, there are different kinds of agency. There's political freedom. There's political freedom, the right for civil and political rights. But if you read carefully section 101 of the Doctrine and Covenants, you'll find that political freedom in the Lord's mind is designed to better enable us to exercise this freedom. I know how he puts it here in verse uh, uh, 77 beginning, according to the laws and constitution of the people which I have suffered to be established and should be maintained for the rights and protection of all flesh according to just and holy principles. Now here's the reason for it, that every man may act in doctrine and principle pertaining to futurity, that is, pertaining to the future, according to the moral agency which I have given. You see that? That moral agency is what is given in the atonement, the power to move up or down, spiritually and morally. See, According to the moral agency which I have given him, that every man may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment. Therefore, it's not right. Therefore, is because it disrupts this order of things, my moral agency, see, because it does that. Therefore, it is not right that any man should be in bondage one to another. And for this purpose have I established the Constitution of this land by the hands of wise men, see, so that we might have a clear and unfettered expression of our moral agency, which is far greater than political freedom. Political freedom is designed for all of its benefits and to enhance and make more free the moral agency which really constitutes the issue of salvation in our lives. Do you see that? Are those unconditional benefits then? Another unconditional benefit is that of resurrection. We've talked about that already. That by the power of the resurrection all people unconditionally come back into God's presence. And then we also talked about it that there is also an unconditional redemption of man from not only physical death, but from spiritual death. The power of the atonement puts everyone on the same equivalent plane that Adam was on before the fall, restores them, gives them their physical body back, and puts them right back up there, and then they have to face the judgment. You see that? Now, the first spiritual death then is cushioned. The last spiritual death, the LSD, is not cushioned, and you can take that every way you want it. All right, now the last spiritual death then is not, but the point is that every person is unconditionally resurrected and every person is unconditionally brought back to God's presence to undergo the judgment. Now what are the conditional benefits? Those things that the Lord doesn't give to everyone, and not that he's partial, he doesn't. He's not a partial God. He doesn't act in any way on the basis of spite. Believe me, he simply has no element of spite in his soul. He doesn't act in any way on the basis of partiality. He simply doesn't do that. That is not part of his character and of his life. He acts solely and purely on the basis of truth, on mercy, righteousness, compassion, with a design to lift people and bring them back into his presence. Now, the gospel plan, though, 
requires, and we'll get into this tomorrow, another thrilling episode we can endure for the plate. We'll get to this then tomorrow that the gospel plan is not just based on the revelation of certain truths and the clarification of truths. The gospel plan is based on the promise of spiritual renewal, spiritual transformation. We'll get to this, but let me just turn for the present to Mosiah chapter 27, verse 25 and 6, where Alma the Younger reports the word, the word of the Lord to himself. And then I want to apply this now to the conditional benefits of the atonement. And he says this in Mosiah 27, verse 25 and 6, And the Lord said unto me, Now here's a revelation from the Lord through this wayward person who was now repentant, named Alma the Younger. The Lord said unto me, Marvel not that all mankind, yea, men and women, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples, must be born again. I doesn't leave anyone out who's an adult. Yea, born of God, changed from their carnal and fallen state. Now again, what does that word state mean? Condition. It doesn't say that you're necessarily carnal, but it does say that in mortality, without the gospel, I am in a carnal, fallen, and carnal state. And it does say that the gospel isn't just for me to learn then a few truths about the three degrees and eternal marriage and, and pre-earth existence and so forth. And even of Christ, it doesn't say that that is, is the program. What it does say, in addition to all of those, is that you've got to have a transformation by divine power. And if we don't have the faith to get the power of the Spirit, the light of, of the Spirit in our lives, plant the seed of faith, and feel that inner power that's light and that's reasonable and that transforms and that changes and that makes us new creatures so that when you come out of the process, you are a new individual. Unless you do that, then there is no salvation offered through Jesus Christ. All right, now, the program for that kind of salvation is conditional. It's conditional in the sense that uh, only those who come unto Christ with a broken heart and a contrite spirit have access to it. I'm not saying everyone who's just a member of the church. I didn't say that. I said everyone who comes unto him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, they and they only get the benefits then of the power of the atonement. Now let's turn to a few scriptures on that. Alma chapter 34, verse 15 and 16, right quick. And thus he shall bring salvation to all those who shall believe on his name, this being the intent of the last sacrifice, to bring about the bowels of mercy which overpowereth justice, and bringeth about means unto men that they may have faith and repentance, and thus mercy can satisfy the demands of justice and encircle them about in the arms of safety, while he that exercised no faith and repentance is exposed to the whole law of the demands of justice, and so forth. All right, now, we're in a legal program. The law of God applies to every one of us. And when we hear the truth and we back off from it, and we don't apply it and receive it with a joy and happiness, then the power of the atonement backs off. And where does that leave us? With the responsibility of paying our own sins. Remember what the Lord said to Martin Harris? I, God, have suffered these things for all men that they might not suffer if they would repent. If they do not repent, though, they must suffer even as I, with suffering cause myself, even God, the greatest of all, has trembled because of pain that bleed at every pore, see? We are caught between the issues of justice and mercy, and unless we exercise the positive faith, and this is not a dormant thing, this is not just having your name on the records, this is hungering and thirsting after righteousness. This is doing for righteousness what you do when you walk down the street and there's a donut shop and the smell is coming out, 
and a whiff of that hits you, Whew. and you do an about face and go in. All right, now, that's what we're talking about. Can you see that? When you hunger and thirst after righteousness, then that righteousness teaches you the need to recognize your fallen state. We are in a lost and a fallen state. And however educated you may be, you can't cope with yourself. One of the lessons I learned years and years ago was I just couldn't handle myself. And I finally got to the point where I just laid siege, serious siege on the thing and said, Lord, you've got to do it. Now, that didn't mean I just gave it up to him and went on. But that did mean that I spent some sessions wrestling. And then particularly when the Spirit of the Lord was coming, I could feel his power, and I knew that I was in his presence, as it were. Then I said, hey, Lord, let me, let me just inject an idea here. You know, tomorrow I might not feel this way. Please, please have mercy on me tomorrow. I know I'm getting to now, and I ask you now to have mercy on me tomorrow. And above all, have me, help me have backbone enough to stand to stand up and be a man. And humility enough to get on my knees and come to you again, see? All right, now, for that kind of situation, then the mercy of Christ comes. Over here, for example, in Alma uh, 42, the great classic statement here on justice versus mercy, where uh, Alma talks about it, beginning now with verse 12. Now there was no means to reclaim man from this fallen state which man had brought upon himself because of his own disobedience. Therefore, according to justice, the plan of redemption could not be brought about only on conditions of repentance of men in this probationary state. Note the word state again. Yea, this preparatory state. For except it were on these conditions, mercy could not take effect except it should destroy the work of justice. Now the justice of God could not be destroyed if so God would cease to be God. He can't set aside law. He just can't pat you on the back and say, hey, forget about it. The only way he can say to us, forget about it, is that he paid the debt himself and justice is satisfied. And he then, in his mercy, says, okay, I'll extend some of the benefits that I acquired in Gethsemane. I'll extend some of these benefits to you. Now, if you understand that and you've got any kind of humanity in your soul, what will you do? You'll not only say, thanks, Lord, but you will gird up your soul and you say, give me now the strength so I don't have to come back and beg some more and do it over again. You see that? And so you meet that because he can't set aside justice. Now he goes on, for example. And he says, And thus we see that all mankind were fallen, and they were in the grasp of justice, yea, the justice of God, which consigned them forever to be cut off from his presence. And now the plan of mercy could not be brought about, except an atonement should be made. Therefore God himself atoned. Now who did it? God himself atoned for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy, to appease the demands of justice, that God might be a perfect, just God and a merciful God also. And so there's a tremendous balance of attributes in Christ through his atonement. Now he goes on, for example, here in verse 22 to 26, and note how he explains this. He says, There is a law given, a punishment affixed, and a Repentance granted, which repentance mercy claimeth. Otherwise, justice exercises, uh, claimeth the creature and executeth the law, and the law inflicted the punishment. If not so, the works of God would be destroyed, and God would cease to be God. Now, if we don't repent, then what has to happen? Justice has to take over, and that's what hell is all about. People then who are individualists to the extent that they go it on their own. They become a law unto themselves. They won't accept of the mercy of Christ, and so the Lord says, I can't help you. The demands of justice are, are there. They, are, they, they cannot 
be set aside, and if you won't let me pay the debt for you, you've got to do it yourself. And so he turns us loose in hell, and we learn by hard experience. Now he goes on and says, But God ceaseth not to be God, verse 23, and mercy claimeth the penitent, and mercy cometh because of the atonement, and the atonement bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead, and the resurrection of the dead bringeth men back into the presence of God. I know we said that, didn't we? It doesn't just reunite your spirit and your body, it brings men back into the presence of God, and thus they are restored to his presence to be judged according to their works, according to the law of justice. Now note how he balances mercy and justice using the male and the female uh, in this balance. And behold, justice exercises all his demands. It's masculine, unflinching, insensitive, like a lot of us guys are. Don't know enough to be sensitive, don't know enough really to care as much as we ought. And that's typical of the male creature. Thus justice exercises all his demands, and also mercy claimeth all which is her own. And it's feminine, isn't it? And thus none but the truly penitent can be saved. What? Do you suppose that mercy can rob justice? I say in you nay, not one whit. If so, God would cease to be God, and thus God bringeth about his great and eternal purpose, which was prepared from the foundation of the world. And what does that word foundation mean? The spirit world is the foundation of the earth. It's that structure on which the Lord organized this physical earth. And when it talks about something from the foundation of the world, it's something that was prepared back there. See? That's the foundation of the world. All right, prepared from the foundation of the world, uh, and thus cometh about the salvation and the redemption of men, and also their destruction and misery. Can I take another five minutes? Let me just apply this now with you to the uh, show how the Book of Mormon prophets applied it. When the Book of Mormon prophets taught the gospel, where did they start? Well, many times they started with the doctrine of the fall. Why? Because you've got to show the problem. You've got to show the problem. Now, what, for example, did Ammon do? Let's just run rapidly through this. Turn to, turn to Alma 19, verse 34. Uh, Ammon 19, verse 34. Note how he puts it. Ammon said unto him, I am a man, and a man in the beginning was created after the image of God, and I am called after the Holy Spirit to teach these things. And a portion of his spirit dwells in me. And then he goes on to verse 36 and says, Now Ammon had said these words, he began at the creation of the world, and also the creation of Adam, and told them all things concerning the fall of man. Now why is that important? Because you've got to know that you're in the midst of a battlefield. You've got to know the challenges, and you've even got to know the hopelessness of the situation without Christ. Otherwise, you're not going to move. And so he taught him then the creation and the doctrine of the fall. Well, now, what effect did this have? Well, Lamoni wanted to give away his sins, and he wanted not just to understand a little of the truth that I am going to teach him. He wanted to be transformed, and as he expressed that desire, the power of the Spirit came into his life. And uh, as that spiritual power came into his life, it so overcame his physical body that he lay incapacitated for a period of time. Finally got so bad that a lot of his court advisors says, hey, the guy needs to be buried. In fact, he stinks. That's the word he uses. And then note his dutiful wife, marvelous how these sisters are. She says, for example, others say that he's dead and that he stinketh, and that he ought to be placed in the sepulcher. But as for myself, he does not stink. Now that's the way it is, brethren. That's how they look at us. And thank the Lord for that. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, now, now note. See, Alma knows, I mean, Ammon knows his business here. And note how the record expresses this. Now, this was what Ammon desired. Now, here's the real missionary who knows what, what the gospel is and what the end result ought to be. This is what Ammon, de Ammon desired. 
He says, for he knew that King Lamoni was under the power of God. Now, he didn't think King Lamoni had just learned a couple of new ideas. They were true. He knew that he was under the power of God, and he knew that the dark veil of unbelief was being cast away from his mind, and the light which did light up his mind, which was the light of the glory of God, which was a marvelous light of his goodness. Yea, this light had infused such joy, here's the joy of redemption, see, infused such joy into his soul, the cloud of darkness having been dispelled, and that the light of everlasting life was lit up in his soul. Yea, he knew that this had overcome his natural frame, and he was carried away in God. Now, what did redemption mean to Lamoni? What did it mean? How is that an example for us? A turn over for example, and we'll conclude on this with, with Aaron and his teachings to the father of King Lamoni. Note, for example, how he puts it, verse 12 of Alma 22. So it came to pass that when Aaron saw that the king would believe in his words, he began from the creation of Adam, reading the scriptures unto the king, how God treated man after his own image, and that God gave his commandments, and, began be and that because of transgression man had fallen. He taught him the doctrine of the fall. And Aaron did expound unto him the scriptures from the creation of Adam laying the fall of man before him and their carnal state, and also the plan of redemption which was prepared from the foundation of the world through Christ for all whosoever would believe in his name, and that since man had fallen he could not merit anything of himself. But the sufferings and death of Christ atone for their sins through faith and repentance and so forth. Now, can you get the Book of Mormon flavor of the gospel and its orientation, see? Well, that's the doctrine of the fall. We can't teach our children to meet the challenges of mortality unless they know the doctrine of the fall. We teach them that they're good kids, and they are. Some of them are the greatest spirits that the Lord has had, not only for this earth, but for all of his creations. Believe me, that's true. There are there are children walking around, young people and on up into the 20s and 30s and 40s and even some of them older than that, who are the greatest spirits in all of the creations of Jesus Christ when they're on this earth and members of the church. And some of them aren't members of the church. Now, you can't teach them how to meet the challenges so that they can fulfill their destiny unless you teach the doctrine of the fall. And it's only then that a person then comes down into the depth of humility and says, Lord, I, 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 think, can't, I can't do it alone. Now, that just, that's not a cop-out. That's a wise calculation. I can't do it alone. And then the next statement is, Lord, but I am going to do it. With the grace of God, I am going to do it. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to master things. I'm going to so sanctify my life so that just the slightest infraction of divine law I become so sensitive that I can feel the tug of the Spirit that says, uh-uh, don't do it. And I follow that Spirit. The thing that I think I pray for most today is this kind of thing. And I believe me, brothers and sisters, I lay siege on it. My personal and private prayers, Lord, I want to be one with you. I want to walk with you. I want to be what you want me to be. And I want to feel the power and enjoy the gifts and the revelations of the Spirit. And I want to be so sensitive that just the slightest hint of something, I know enough to pull back into solid ground, relying on your grace and your strength. And I do this now because I'm in a battlefield. I'm under the power of the fall, and I need that strength and input from Christ. I testify to you that it can be done that Jesus is the Christ, that he's alive today. He can be a personal power in our lives. He can give you revelation upon revelation in the nighttime, by dreams, by visions, by the manifestations of the Spirit, and you can become alive in Christ. And that life, then, is the life of everlasting life that leads to his presence and the strength and power of the Spirit that you find in its fullness.
And that, my brothers and sisters, is what the Book of Mormon is about, and that's what President Benson is trying to get us to get. May the Lord bless us to do it, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Couple of three questions. Second Nephi twenty two. Does this include other worlds remain the same state? To read section eighty eight, beginning with about verse fifty, the Lord gives a parable there about his ministration to other worlds. If you read that the statement on through there, beginning about verse fifty on through, you find that it makes it clear that these other worlds are in a fallen state. And then as you couple that with Moses chapter 1 in the Pearl of Great Price, you find that this business of creating worlds and then having them pass away, and creating some more worlds and having them pass away, has been going on for some time. The Lord said to Moses that many had been created and many had passed away. And in that sense then, uh, in Moses' day, they hadn't been redeemed. Uh, and prior to Christ's redemption on this earth, as I understand it, worlds that were created, Christ ministered to them. They had a millennial period, uh, a coming of Christ to them. It wasn't necessarily a second coming because he didn't come on earth and live and get crucified, but it was a coming of Christ in a millennial period to them. And in that millennial period, they developed the powers of the Spirit to the point that many of them were translated. And they were given then a translated state of existence. And what the Prophet Joseph taught is that all of the translated portions of these prior worlds, prior to ours, that Enoch then, for this earth, is given a presidency over them. Read the teachings, page 170 to 72. And in that sense, then, Enoch has a presidency over them. And uh, uh, Enoch belongs to this earth. And in the final wind-up will be subordinate to Joseph Smith in the dispensation of the fullness of time, which will incorporate all past dispensations, including Enoch, into this one to give the final ultimate fullness. And that begins to reveal the picture, then, of where we are in relation to the atonement and where this dispensation is in relation to the atonement. Glorious picture. Someday I'd like to feel free to talk about the whole thing in the sense of the prophet understood it. But as you say, then, does this include other worlds? They remain the same. They did for a fall, but as, uh, well, let me turn to Moses chapter 1, where the, where the Lord talks about worlds without number have I created. And uh, then he goes on to say this, And the first man of all men have I called Adam, which is many. But only an account of this earth give I unto you. Now these are the worlds. The Lord put an Adam and Eve on it, and they went through the same basic process. Now, Adam is a title. It's a title of transition to the fallen state, see. And uh, uh, the first man of all men on all of these worlds the Lord calls Adam. And they had their Garden of Eden period of time, and then their fall, but they had to wait for Christ to come to this earth to make the atonement. And so what happened to the righteous? Many of them were translated. He gives authority over them. And then how about salvation for the dead for them? Well, when Christ made the atonement, that opened up salvation for the dead. There was no salvation for the dead. It wasn't right to apply it prior to the, to the atonement of Christ. And so Enoch holds these keys over all these translated portions of the world. And he says, okay, do you guys want to be resurrected, or would you like to do the work for your dead? Some of them wanted to, to be resurrected, like when the Lord gave certain promises to the apostles. Peter and others wanted to, to be, go and immediately uh, not stay in the spirit world too long, but come into Christ's kingdom, which is the resurrected kingdom. And then John said, I'd like to hang around as a translated being. I'd like to do a little more work around here, see? Well, these people then, many of them elected to hang around and to do the work for their dead. And Enoch presides over that. Now, that's a part of this whole cosmic picture of which Christ is the center, see? And, uh, but they did have their Garden of Eden and their fall. Okay? If the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Christ, how can he be a personage? Okay? Glad to have that one clarified. When you talk about the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, realize you need to make a distinction. There is a power, an essence. It's kind of like sunlight. It's a power. It emanates from God. And we call this the Holy Spirit. 
Now, we also, in this broken language that we call English, used the term Holy Spirit to designate a person. So that the person of the Holy Ghost, then, is subordinate to Christ. Now, Christ gives him his power, which is the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? This essence, this thing that emanates. And then this person, the Holy Ghost, who is a spirit personage, emanates that power to us, see? And so differentiate between the substance or the essence of the Holy Spirit and the person of the Holy Spirit. We were talking about the person over here, okay? Now, one other question. If Adam's physical body was the literal Son of God, why was Christ known as the only begotten of the Father in the flesh? He's talking about the mortal state. For example, here in uh, the book of Moses, uh, uh, this is chapter 6, verse 22. This is the genealogy of the sons of Adam, who was the Son of God, with whom God himself converse. Now, the rib story is a cover-up. The heathen mind not worthy to know the origins of life. The rib story also is a very beautiful, symbolic portrayal. Mother Eve was taken from Adam's side. She wasn't taken out of his head. She wasn't taken out of his foot. She was taken from his side. If she was taken out of his head, then Adam would have the last word, which would be, yes, honey. <laughs> if she was taken out of his foot, then Adam could walk on her, and men and women still get walked on, and it ought not to be. She's taken out of his side, which denotes the one flesh concept, the fact that he can get his arm around her here, and they can walk together in the union of life. See, it's a symbolic story. But uh, procreation is the key. Okay? Now, if Christ is the God of this earth, what then happens to our relationship with Elohim? We pray to him, albeit through the Son, or we have two separate relationships with Elohim, or one with Jehovah, or is our only relationship with Elohim through Christ? Another good question. Let me turn to section 76 on that one. Here in section 76, the Lord is talking about celestial life and the relationships of the celestial kingdom. And uh, note how he puts it. He uh, says, These are they who are the church of the firstborn. Now, the church of the firstborn is the sanctified, called, elected, and made sure church that exists in the celestial kingdom, where we ultimately will get. It's a church of exalted fathers and mothers, of priests and kings. And so he says, they are they who are priests and kings, who have received of his fullness and of his glory, and are priests of the Most High God after the order of Melchizedek, which was after the order of Enoch, and we'll talk about that when we get the Holy Order a little later. He says, wherefore is written, they are gods, even the sons of God. Now note. Wherefore, all things are these, whether life or death, all things are present. Let me read that. Wherefore, all things are theirs, whether life or death, or things present, or things which are to come. All are theirs, and they are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Now, what's the relationship? Jesus said in John 17 concerning his disciples, Thine they were but thou gavest them to me. Now, in order for our Father in Heaven's children to have redemption, what must our Father in Heaven do? Give them away. To whom does he give them? He gives them to his firstborn. He gives them to his only begotten. Now, technically speaking, there is only one heir in the Father's kingdom. Now, I'm not spelling that E-R-R, -R, so forth. I'm talking H-E-I-R. There is only one heir in the Father's kingdom. And who is that one alone heir? Jesus Christ and him crucified, okay? And when we come through to be heirs, it's joint heirs through and with Jesus Christ. And it's under Christ. We take upon ourselves his name. He becomes our father. And in the final analysis, when the Father delivers, I mean, Christ delivers the kingdom of the Father, this glorifies the Father. 
But then the Father takes the whole thing, gives him to Christ as his heir. And in this relationship, in this relationship, Christ then is our Lord and our God and our Father. Now, do we have a relationship with our Father in heaven personally? Yes. Yeah. But it's through Christ. Because the fall came in between. The fall came in between. And that destroyed everything. It destroyed everything. It made us devils. If it, if it hadn't been for Christ, it would make us devils. It makes us enemies to God. It's like Paul says in Romans chapter 8. They that follow the Spirit, they are the sons of God. See? And it's qualified. They that follow the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Now that's the picture, see? And so we're given to Christ, and he becomes our Father. And in eternity then, then we are Christ, and Christ is God's. Thank you. Uh, one question. We'll take one more. We're taught that we cannot become perfected until we are resurrected. <clears throat> hey, I'm glad someone's studying. He made the world before this world, which were endless. He made them only <clears throat> Mm -hmm. All right, what is perfection? Perfection isn't keeping all the commandments. That's only a means. Now, I just wish I could keep them all. <laughs> I think I was perfect. But Jesus, the guy comes up to him and says, Good master. And what did Jesus say? Check your mind like that. There's none good but the Father. I'm not good. There's none good but the Father. Now, what is perfection? Perfection isn't just keeping all the commandments. Perfection is to have the fullness of the attributes, the fullness of the Spirit, the fullness of the love of God. Ellen May, for example, is teaching about the tree of life. That kind of love that we call charity is an endowment. It's the love of Christ. And put a circle around the word of, O-F. It's his love. He's got it. I don't have it until he'll give it to me. You see that? Now, Jesus, while he was conceived with the glory of the Father in him, and while he had great power and great glory, didn't have the eternal celestial fullness, and hence he was not perfect. And so he only used the Father as an example of perfection there at the conclusion of Matthew 5. Be therefore perfect as your Father. But when he had received that endowment, and then he was perfect in the endowments and the attributes and the fullness of glory. And then he said to the Nephites, I would that you should be perfect even as I and your Father in heaven be perfect. Thing. Okay, now, perfection then is getting the fullness of the Spirit. You never really conduct yourself like you ought to until the Spirit flows in your life. And that's true. Hey, it's been great. We'll see you uh, at uh, 6 o'clock and we're going to talk about some unpleasant things. I hate the great prophetic picture of the latter days and the sanctification of Zion and the cleansing of Zion. So we'll see at six. Thank you.